Hi everybody, I hope that you're all doing really well. So today I am back to talk about some of my favourite books that I've read so far in 2020. Yeah, I can't believe that we're already here. <laughs> on the one hand, it feels like this year has just been so, so, so long already. And on the other hand, it's like, it's July. How did that happen? How? At the beginning of the year, I did set myself a few little reading goals that I wanted to try and accomplish during 2020, one of which was to set up a booktube channel, which, yay, I've done. Uh, one of them was to try and read at least one history nonfiction book every single month, which I've been able to do. Uh, one was to read at least one classic every month, which I think I have managed to do maybe, possibly, we'll see. But one big goal of 2020 for me was to try to read more books that I just really, really loved so much that I would want to rate them five stars. Believe it or not, that can be quite a hard ask from me. I don't think of myself as being a supremely critical reader, but I definitely do find it hard to push a book to five stars. I rate a lot of books four stars and think, yeah, that was pretty, pretty good, but it doesn't have, you know, that little je ne sais quoi uh, that would really need to push a book up to five stars. And yeah, Goodreads ratings are not the most scientific metric. Uh, it is very, very subjective, but um, I felt kind of sad because I think I only rated like eight or nine books five stars last year. And it wasn't that every other book that I read had been terrible. It's just, I hadn't, been picking up stuff that absolutely floored me and I wanted more of that experience of my reading. And you know it is all luck as to whether or not you pick up a book and you end up absolutely loving it but I am very very pleased to say that I have gotten to the point already this year where I have rated 10 books five stars and I largely didn't want to include rereads in my five stars list though there is one which uh, I did include because I'd originally rated it a four star and then when I reread it I bumped it up to a five so I think that's fine I think that counts. Also from those 10 books I will just say one of them was a book that I read right at the beginning of July and this list is strictly for books that I read between January and June so I've been very very strict with myself I've not included it hold my horses, but I do really like that book and you'll hear about it in my July wrap up. But yes, without much further ado, because I have been rambling for a very, very long time, here are the books that I have absolutely loved in 2020. The very first book that I rated five stars in 2020 was Lowborn, Growing Up, Getting Away and Returning to Britain's Poorest Towns by Kerry Hudson. Through this memoir, Kerry Hudson charts her childhood growing up in poverty, going from different council flat to council flat, often having to live in bed and breakfast with her mother to eventually being able to go to university and get a well-paying job and becoming a writer and being able to essentially escape from this cycle of poverty. The book also charts her going back to the places that she used to live as a child. Through this memoir, Kerry Hudson is really trying to dispel this kind of romanticized notion that I think a lot of people have of having a working class background as this very happy-go-lucky, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and everything will be fine kind of narrative. And also dispelling this notion that, you know, growing up in poverty is just not a thing that happens in the UK, that it's this either Dickensian thing, you know, that was of years gone by but doesn't exist today, or something that happens in other countries, but, you know, people are fine in the UK. It's really not the case, and she's really trying to shine a light on just how ignored poverty in the UK is. And how in the 20 years since she left these poorest parts of Scotland, things have not changed and how we really need to push to make more and more changes in government to combat poverty. You really get the sense that the reason that Kerry was able to get out of her situation was often just due to luck of being in the right place at the right time, of having the right opportunity just land in your lap. But not everybody has that kind of opportunity and she is very, very aware of that, that she was lucky in a lot of ways. Yes, she did work hard, but you can work so, so hard and never have some of the opportunities that she got. Through the book, we go back and forth through each chapter between her telling us her experiences as being a child and then the next chapter will be her going back as an adult to some of these places. And it really just leaves you with the emphasis of how this kind of childhood experience doesn't leave you. It's not just something that you can forget and move on from. That growing up in this kind of poverty really does leave its mark on you and really does influence your choices in later life. I know a lot of people were talking about this last year and really singing its praises and I'm back here to say that yes, this is a very important read and I do recommend that people 
give this a shot because it's very, very good. The next book is The Other Bennett Sister by Janice Hadlow. I know I talked about this ad nauseum in my mid-year book freak out tag, but I'm here singing its praises again because this really is my favourite book that I've read so far this year. I adore this. The Other Bennett Sister tells the story of Pride and Prejudice, but through the perspective of Mary Bennett, who was the third of the five daughters. Mary is known as being very bookish, very studious, very sanctimonious, and unfortunately not beautiful. She is described as being the plain child. And as the very first sentence of the book proclaim, it is a hard fact of life that if a young woman is unlucky enough to come into the world without expectations, she had better do all she can to ensure she is born beautiful. To be poor and handsome is misfortune enough, but to be penniless and plain is a hard fate indeed. This book tracks Mary's experiences off Pride and Prejudice and her perspective on the traditional story, but then goes further along um, to after Mr. Bennett has died and how she makes her way in the world once her family has been scattered, once her family home has been given to Mr. Collins and Charlotte Lucas, as we always knew that it was eventually going to come to. It's a story about Mary Bennett really coming into her own and coming to like herself because she had spent so much of her life being told by everybody around her that she just was not good enough, that she was too plain, that she wasn't talented, that she wasn't charming, and the effect that that kind of day-to-day -day conditioning can really do a number on your self-esteem. As somebody who spent a good chunk of my teenage years feeling like the Mary Bennett of my friendship group, feeling like I wasn't pretty enough, that I wasn't smart enough, that I wasn't talented enough, that I wasn't even charming on top of that, um, this, this felt like such a comfort read, and oh, I loved it a lot. I really, really did. I definitely want to reread this at some point. And I know a lot of people I'd seen talking about this had said they really enjoyed it, but like the pacing was off, that it was too long, too dragged out. Um, and as I said in my mid-year book freakout tag, I am definitely the kind of person that if I really like a book, I want it to be as long as possible. So yeah, it didn't bother me. I just savored every single page and I wanted it to be longer because when I'm just in a world that I love so much, I just want to be there for as long as possible. So yeah, I love this very much. If you're a Pride and Prejudice fan, um, I don't think you'll be disappointed pointed with this. You didn't think that we were going to have a video about my favourite books of the year without talking about the Thomas Cromwell trilogy, did you? Yes, another set of books that I have talked about ad nauseum. I, ah, oh, I adore these books. <laughs> to say that I was not really that big a fan of Wolf Hall the first time I read it last year, the amount that I have jumped onto this bandwagon is just insane. <laughs> I'd probably say that I ranked Wolf Hall out of four stars, but Bring Up the Bodies and The Mirror in the Light were just very firm five-star favourites for me. Absolutely fantastic historical fiction. The way that Hilary Mantel is able to just drop you so perfectly into this world and you really do get so immersed in the Tudor time period. You read these books and you can just see everything that Thomas Cromwell is seeing, you can smell everything that he is smelling, you can hear every action on the street that is happening. It's just breathtaking to read. And she managed to make me care about Thomas Cromwell, a character in history who I never thought I was gonna sympathize with. Like, she did it. <laughs> Give her all the awards, thank you. <laughs> And you know that I really enjoyed reading them this time around because I did pretty much do them back to back. Like I, I did 2000 pages of a historical fiction series when I already don't think of myself as being a big historical fiction reader in the span of about a month. So I think, I think that's pretty good going. Another book that I've already talked about quite a few times on the channel already is Sir Gawain and the Green Knight with the translation by Simon Armitage. I read this back in April, kind of expecting that it was going to be okay, but I was I was just so entertained by this. This is a circa 14th century chivalric romance poem all about Sir Gawain, who is a knight at the court of King Arthur, who on Christmas Day accepts a challenge to fight this mysterious Green Knight. Though the condition that the Green Knight sets for him is that whatever blow Sir Gawain deals to him, the Green Knight will come and meet him a year from now and will deal back whatever blow Sir Gawain dealt to him. Sir Gawain fights against him and he does win, but unfortunately he knows that eventually he's gonna have to meet this Green Knight again and he then procrastinates the entire year, does not prepare himself. On his way to confront the Green Knight a year later, he gets waylaid and spends a lovely Christmas with another court. I mean, Sir Gawain procrastinates this challenge at a rate that university students can only understand. And like I've said before, this is just 
just really, really good fun. I always harp on about how alliterative this translation is, but I think that just adds to the enjoyment level. Now on the subject of supper, I'll say no more, as it's obvious to everyone that no one went without, because another sound, a new sound, suddenly drew near, which might signal the king to sample his supper. For barely had the horns finished blowing their breath, and with starters just spooned to the seated guests, a fearful form appeared, framed in the door, a mountain of a man, immeasurably high, a hulk of a human from head to hips, so long and thick in his loins and his limbs, I should genuinely judge him to be a half-giant, or a most massive man, the mightiest of mortals. But handsome too, like any horseman worth his horse, for despite the bulk and brawn of his body, his stomach and waist were slender and sleek. In fact, in all features he was finely formed, it seemed. Amazement seized their minds, no soul had ever seen, a knight of such kind, entirely emerald green. Yeah, it's just really, really good fun, and I think would be like quite a nice introduction to medieval chivalric romance if you have never read anything like this before. Don't stress yourself out, don't start with Beowulf, start with this. A poetry collection that I know I've definitely shouted out quite a few times before but deserves it is Somebody Give This Heart a Pen by Sophia Thakur. Sophia Thakur is predominantly a performance poet and this is her first published poetry collection and it is just brilliant and I'm definitely going to read anything else that she publishes from now on. This collection is just full of so many beautiful poems all about growing up in the 21st century, growing up mixed race, um, the power of relationships and of friendships, of trying to find and carve out your identity. There are poems about body image, about police brutality. There are so many different themes and topics that she covers through these poems and yet it all seems very cohesive and like everything works very well together. There are so many different poems that I tabbed, as you can see. I always tab whenever a poem really, really speaks to me. And yeah, this was just fantastic. To say that I bought this on a bit of a whim just because I saw it in my local bookshop, I, I was just so blown away by this poetry collection. Like I say, this poetry collection focuses on so many different topics, um, but here is one in particular, which is about body image. My nose is bigger than, my lips are smaller than, my makeup is less than, my hair is thicker than, this hip, this curve, this waist will not satisfy me, these legs are in transition, my abs need to look like hers, we have stopped looking through our own eyes and put someone else's first. My body was once better than comparison, but other images of beauty have long stained my eyes, and I cannot help but plaster potential over every part of me, and see much of my anatomy as space to rectify, forgetting how it felt to look myself up and down, and be at the very least satisfied. There are short little paragraph long poems, and then there are poems that span multiple pages, and yeah, there's I think there's something in here that will appeal to pretty much any poetry reader, so... I really highly recommend this, I think you should read it. I've read quite a few history books that I really enjoyed this year, but I think my favourite so far has been The Lady in the Tower, The Fall of Anne Boleyn by Alison Weir. I've shouted Alison Weir's praises many, many times on my channel already. I just think she is a fantastic writer, especially at writing accessible, engaging history that even if you are a beginner to reading about these different historical topics, you will really engage with and enjoy. And yet at no point do I ever feel like Alison Weir is being very simplistic in her explanations of these historical topics or being reductionist. I just think that she knows what she's doing. She, she knows how to write for a mass audience very, very well. And yes, this is Alison Weir's take on the final months of Anne Boleyn's life, her fall and her execution. Kind of echoing back to the Hilary Mantel, if you were a fan of Bring Up the Bodies and you wanted to get a little bit more of the history surrounding that, definitely pick this up. This is one of my favourite periods to read about in the court of Henry VIII is the fall of Anne Boleyn. Because I'm a basic history fan, Anne Boleyn is probably my favourite of the six wives. She is one of my favourite historical figures, which I always find hilarious considering that I was raised Catholic. I'm just a very bad Catholic who enjoys Anne Boleyn. Mia culpa, mia culpa. <laughs> I just find her the most interesting. She is such a complex, controversial, complicated figure. There are so many ways in which you can really admire what she does and then other ways where you're like, Anne, no, honey, what are you doing? No, no, no. And through this look at the last months of Anne Boleyn's life, Alison Weir really, really interrogates all of the sources surrounding Anne Boleyn's fall. Because predictably, it is very, very hard to find a non biased contemporary account of what happened to Anne Boleyn. Even on her way up, it's very, very hard to find 
find that, to, so to find that in her fall when everybody was against her, ugh, she really does work to separate out the wheat from the chaff in this book and I really really enjoyed it. Though I don't know how I would feel about Thomas Cromwell if I reread this because I did read this prior to reading the Wolf Hall trilogy so Ah, oh, the controversial figures of history, what would we do without them? <laughs> Another fantastic book that I have read so far this year is My Dark Vanessa by Kate Elizabeth Russell. This tells the story of Vanessa Y and her relationship to her English teacher with whom she had an affair at the age of 15. So the story does go back and forth between her time at high school and her initial affair with her teacher and then a second timeline while she is in her 30s where her teacher has recently been outed to the public by a former student for his sexual abuse of students. And the book is really about Vanessa having to come to terms with her experiences as a teenager. Vanessa is being appealed to to also come forward and talk about her experiences of her abuse from this teacher, but Vanessa is adamant that her experience was consensual, that they both loved each other, and that the relationship between her and her English teacher was not abusive, despite the fact that we know she was 15 years old. She could not have consented to this. In the sections when she's 15 years old, you really get into her mindset of how she is experiencing this relationship and how she can be repeatedly telling herself that what's happening is okay. And yeah, it is really, really hard to read at times. It's absolutely haunting to read. I'm not somebody who typically gets very, very emotionally affected by books that I read. Like I can recognize that something is like, oh, that's not very nice, but I never get like really dragged down by a book. But this this did really, really affect me when I was reading it. I felt myself kind of slipping into her mindset. I felt my mood going down. I felt like this feeling of wanting to be secretive about something that was happening to somebody else. And I think that's what really makes this book so good is the way that Kate Elizabeth Russell is really able to place you in the mind off this woman. Even if you get frustrated with her and you don't always agree with the choices that she's making, especially when she is in her 30s and is making choices to try and protect um, her teacher, you kind of understand how she got there. Because at the end of the day, what happened to her was not her fault. The onus is not on her. It is entirely on this teacher who abused his power. I thought it was really powerful and really, really haunting. And yeah, it's not going to be for everybody because there are a lot of like very challenging, upsetting things that happen. Um, but if you do want to read this, I would highly recommend it. And then the final book, which is one of my favourites of this year, which shouldn't really count because technically it is a reread, but I had to mention it, I had to mention it, is The Song of Achilles by Madeline Miller. Like I say, because this was a reread, I did read this uh, at the end of last year. I technically should not include this, but the fact that I had originally rated this a four star and then reread this in June and then pushed it up to a five star and it has become one of my favorite books of all time, I feel like I can't not mention this, especially because this book has really shaped where a lot of my reading has gone since then. I have been reading a lot more like ancient Greek myth retellings and enjoying every second of it. So I feel like I would be remiss to not include this in my favorite books of the year so far. So I'm cheating but you should read it, so. As I've said before, this tells the story of the relationship between Achilles and Patroclus, told from the perspective of Patroclus after he is banished from his own home after killing a boy, being sent off to live with Achilles and his father's court, and the relationship that really blossoms between them as young boys and then into teenagers and into men. Patroclus's absolute love and loyalty to Achilles despite the fact that his mother, the sea goddess Thetis, absolutely abhors him. She doesn't think that Patroclus is worthy of Achilles just as being a friend and so when their relationship eventually escalates to them being lovers, she is even more enraged. And yet Achilles stands firm with Patroclus and defends him and it's, it's just so beautiful. And then eventually, partway through the book, they are dragged in to fighting in the Trojan War and you know where it's gonna go, but it doesn't make it any less devastating. And yeah, rereading this just gave me a newfound love of ancient Greek myths and myth retellings, which I'd never really had before. I'm never, I've never really been much of a fan of fairy tale and myth retellings. But yes, since rereading this in June, I've already uh, read The Silence of the Girls. I have reread a new translation of The Odyssey. So yeah, it's, it's firmly fixed in my mind as one of my favorite books. And if you haven't read it, then do. 
it's definitely worth your time and it's just beautiful and devastating and I love it very very much. So yes those were some of my favourite books that I've read so far in 2020. Have you read any of these books? Let me know, let me know what you thought about them, let me know about some of your favourite books that you've read so far this year. I hope that you are having a fantastic fantastic day and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks, bye!